Okay, well, the subject tonight is uh, the rapture and the second coming. Uh, the Greek word for rapture, which is generally translated caught up, um, is harpazo. Uh, so I just put it up there just so that... So if you hear uh, that word, um, there are some uh, scriptures which actually we won't be looking at tonight, but... Uh, are often referred to in regard to the rapture. Like one shall be, you know, often you'll hear them preach, one will be uh, taken, uh, taken up, another one will uh, be left behind. Um, but the word that's used there in the Greek is uh, paralambano, not harpazo. And uh, paralambano, which is of course a base word for the parallel, um, and it's talking about people going out from one place to another place horizontally, not vertically, where the rapture is a, is a vertical uh, thing. And when Jesus was taken by Joseph and Mary um, to Egypt, it uses that word, paralambano. Uh, and then when they brought Jesus back again, it was paralambano. Um, it's the same word that's used in, in Matthew 24, there where it talks about uh, you know, there is uh, one who is, uh, uh, is taken and one who is um, left uh, behind. Um, so it's not talking about the rapture, it's talking about people going out from one location to another location. And both of those things apply in the last days because as we saw and referred to um, in the, the study on the Exodus that we looked at, that is a uh, horizontal uh, movement of God's people um, out of Egypt, coming into uh, uh, through the Sinai and eventually over to Israel. And that's the same concept, the paralambano, that is also used in relationship to, uh, let's say, the final Exodus. You've got the first Exodus, which was Israel coming out of Egypt, and the final exodus um, is when the church is coming uh, out into the wilderness in preparation for the second coming um, of Christ. And <clears throat> uh, that particular event, that's the horizontal movement of God's people. Interestingly, the one in Exodus chapter 12 that we uh, looked at uh, uh, or referred to, the exodus, it says that uh, God said, I brought you out on eagles' wings. Um, but they didn't fly. They walked. Um, so when they walked out of uh, Egypt on eagles' wings, the eagles' wings speaks of the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, it was a divine deliverance. In fact, it says even their shoes were not going to run out so, uh, or wear out. So when we get to the end of uh, the scriptures in Revelation 12, now we see a movement of God's people also on eagles' wings. Um, so, uh, you know, they that mount up with wings as eagles, <laughs> you know, they shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. It's a divine provision of, of God taking uh, his, uh, his people um, out of let's say, harm's way, because that's what they were in, in Egypt. Pharaoh was after them and punishing them, and they were taken out. And they, they, that was the start of the journey, on eagle's wings. In Revelation 12, we see the end of the journey. Now they're coming out, and they're about to head off, uh, you know, three and a half years later, um, into the uh, presence of God, living in the 1,000-year millennial reign um, of Christ. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful um, picture. But the rapture, the harpazo, is a vertical um, thing. It's a, different, it's a different scenario. So the, the paralambano is the horizontal and the harpazo is the being snatched away, being caught uh, away and taken up on a vertical uh, journey. Well, in study number one that we did um, what, six to eight weeks ago? Uh, in study one, we looked at the eternal purpose of God, that is, God's desire desires a people in his likeness and image to have a victorious and 
perfect church to be his bride. Now, that's, that was what is the heart of God, and that's what we looked at in the first of the studies. The second study, we looked at the multiple appearings of Christ throughout Scripture leading up to the Day of Atonement when he will appear to his church in his temple. So right through the Old Testament and several times in the New Testament, we see the Lord appearing uh, to his people, not to everybody, just to uh, his people in special um, circumstances. Sometimes it was just to one person, um, like when he wrestled with um, um, uh, Jacob, when he wrestled with um, Manoah, uh, when he came and saw uh, was it Gideon. Um, you know, these are just similar uh, parts of the examples, um, which in theology they call... Um, uh, you know, it's a, you, you look at these words and you say, what on earth does that word mean? It's a theophany. Um, it comes from two Greek words, theos and phanos, uh, which means uh, divine appearings, um, supernatural um, appearings. But we find that in the New Testament, uh, after his resurrection, Christ appeared 500 people at one time, at one stage, apart from all of the, uh, the disciples. Uh, then he ascended into heaven. Well, they saw him ascend up into heaven, but then it wasn't long after that, um, well, it was a few years later, uh, Jesus uh, appears to the Apostle Paul um, in, in Damascus. Then <clears throat> later on uh, to John on the island of uh, Patmos. And then that's all pointing towards the final, uh, let's say, appearing of Christ on the Day of Atonement. And we had a, a good study in Hebrews chapter 9. The whole of Hebrews chapter 9 is the Day of Atonement, or in Hebrew it's called Yom Kippur. It's also in uh, Leviticus chapter 16. It's also in Revelation chapter uh, 8, John chapter 7. I mean, these are some of the chapters that talk about that particular occasion where Jesus, when he celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles in his life, in his ministry, uh, he sent his brothers ahead uh, to the feast. He didn't go with them. He said, my time hasn't come. But when uh, <clears throat> they had gone, Jesus came secretly. He didn't come publicly. He came secretly to the temple. And we saw a number of scriptures about the appearing of, uh, of the Lord in his temple. Well, who's his temple? We are uh, his temple. And do you know all the scriptures that talk about how in, I lay in Zion for a foundation, uh, a chief uh, cornerstone. Uh, all of those are talking about the cornerstone of the temple. That's exactly the scripture that the Apostle Paul quotes in Ephesians chapter 2 when he talks about the church is the temple um, of the living God. So all of those prophecies are speaking about the revelation um, of the, uh, the, the true temple and, and that's why, and, uh, and, and Tam refused, referred to it on Sunday, uh, about the fact that we are the third temple. We are the real temple of the living God, not made with the hands of man, but by the power of the, the Spirit of God. And Jesus Christ is the high priest of this temple. He couldn't be the priest in an earthly temple in Jerusalem because that priesthood is the Aaronic priesthood. And that forbids anybody other than somebody born in the tribe of Levi and of the house of Aaron to become um, the priest. Well, that disqualifies Jesus. This is one reason why the law, uh, and that's one, you could say one of the curses of the law, is they couldn't have Jesus as high priest because he is, that's why he's called the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, uh, is a Hebrew word made from two words, Melek, meaning king, and Sedek, meaning righteousness. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness. So uh, anyway, so study number uh, three, we looked at the exodus um, of the overcoming church, where his church will be protected under his eagle wing power. And you can see that in Psalm 91, we will abide under the shadow of the wings um, of the Almighty. And a thousand will fall on one side and 10,000 on, on the other, but it won't come near you because we will be under the divine protection. Yes, we'll be on the earth during the Great Tribulation. We will not be caught up and floating around in uh, 
uh, you know, the clouds, we will be on the earth, but under divine protection, just like the children of Israel in the land of Goshen. In the land of Goshen, they were under divine protection as the wrath of God was poured out um, upon Pharaoh. Likewise, in Psalm 91, we see that we will witness with our own eyes the judgment of God against the heathen. Um, and we're actually going to see it. We're going to be right there. We're going to be there on the spot. And the devil is going to attack us, but he can't touch us. Um, it says the, uh, he spews out water from his mouth because he wants to devour us. But what happens? Well, the earth helps us. The earth swallows up uh, this attack. And we can see Psalm 23 getting fulfilled. He prepares a table uh, for me in the midst of my enemy. So our enemies all around about. Satan can't touch us. The Antichrist can't touch us. And we're having a little feast um, out there in, uh, in the presence um, of the Lord. Noah's another one too. Hmm? Noah's another one. Yeah, Noah is uh, another one. But he was on the earth. He wasn't... Uh, now, some people quote that and say, who's an example of the rapture? You know, Noah was taken out of the world. Well, well you know, he, he became the first stockbroker in the world. You know, he floated all of his stock while the rest of the world was in liquidation. <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, in, in, in the studies number four, we're looking at the rapture and the second coming. But uh, how many of you have heard of Corrie ten Boom? Now, famous uh, um, Dutch woman who was put into uh, the, um, uh, the death camps. And in fact, most of the women, including her sister, uh, died there. Um, and she um, went to a number of countries, Africa and China, Indonesia as well, where there had been terrible persecution. And she came across the same problem with those who were teaching a pre-tribulation rapture and how the churches had been taught by the missionaries, mainly from the United States, uh, who were teaching that they would not suffer uh, persecution and great tribulation. They were going to get raptured um, out of the place and that they would be, would be safe. Uh, well... Multiple, multiple thousands, tens of thousands were being killed, slain, tortured uh, in, in, uh, in the persecution. And Corrie ten Boom was most agitated uh, by the impact of this teaching on a pre-tribulation rapture. So um, I thought I'd include just a little bit of her testimony at the start. Um, it's quite a long testimony, but I've only just taken a little bit at the start. Testimony of Corrie ten Boon regarding pre-tribulation rapture teaching in China. But in, in her testimony, she talks about in, in Africa and other places as well. So uh, she wrote uh, this letter from China uh, to America's pastors in 1974. My sister Betsy and I were in the Nazi concentration camp at Ravensbrück because we committed the crime of loving Jews. 700 of us from Holland, France, Russia, Poland and Belgium were herded into a room built for 200. As far as I knew, Betsy and I were the only two representatives of heaven in that room. We may have been the Lord's only representatives in that place of hatred. Yet because of our presence there, things changed. Jesus said, in the world you, will, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We too are to be overcomers, bringing the light of Jesus into a world filled with darkness and hate. There are some among us teaching there will be no tribulation, that the Christians will be able to escape all this. These are the false teachers that Jesus was warning us to expect in the last days. No, she calls them false teachers. Um, I, I would say they're people that haven't been taught very well. Uh, most of them have little knowledge of what is already going on across the world. I have been in countries where the saints are already suffering terrible persecution. In China, the Christians were told, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, you will be translated or raptured. 
Then uh, came terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say sadly, we have failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them Jesus would come first. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when the tribulation comes, to stand and not faint. So that's the little bit that I've just taken from Corey Ten uh, Boone, uh, and it's, uh, it's a very moving uh, testimony. Well, we'll start off with saying that Jesus taught a post-tribulation rapture. Um, and let's just have a look at the verses. Jesus did not teach a pre-tribulation rapture. He taught a post-tribulation rapture. Uh, Matthew chapter 24, 9 to 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Well, you can't say you're going to get raptured if you're going to get killed. You're going to get killed. Okay. And, and what we're going to look at just a little bit later on, there are two periods of tribulation. One period is called the 10 days of great tribulation, which is a general tribulation and persecution against the church all over the world. I believe we're in that time right now. The next period of tribulation um, is the, uh, during the reign of the uh, Antichrist. Um, but we'll find that uh, uh, there are probably more Christians killed in this, what's called the 10 days of great tribulation, rather than the, the, the time of the Antichrist. Because just in a country like Sudan, um, in the last uh, 30 years, um, there have been more than one and a half million Christians slain uh, by the jihadists. Um, try and tell the churches there, uh, look, you're not going to suffer great tribulation, you're going to get raptured out of here. No, that's not the case. Um, we need to, to learn how to stand strong. And, and Jesus actually told um, the, the, uh, those who are already martyrs and they're under the altar you know, in the book of Revelation and they're saying, Lord, how long shall it be that we you know, will suffer these things? And Jesus says to them, uh, you know, be, be faithful and uh, hang on in there because your numbers are not complete. There are many more that are going to be added to your numbers. Jesus didn't say, uh, look, these guys ones are all going to get... Uh, you know, um, you know, uh, put on a rocket ship and taken out of here. No, uh, Jesus was teaching that there would be a lot of persecution. Many Christians were going to die um, as martyrs. And in countries like Australia, we tend to think that, oh, you know, that's only overseas. But, you know, it's coming to Australia as well. We, we, it's coming all over the world. Um, now, we've even seen... Uh, let's say over the last 10 years, a rise in the number of churches that have been burned down um, here in Australia, you know, that have been attacked. Maybe we haven't had the mass persecutions, but we still need to be um, uh, having faith that God will provide and that even in the face of persecution, uh, even in the face of martyrdom, we need to be faithful unto death. And one of the things that Paul said he said, all who live godly in Christ Jesus. How many here believe we should live godly in Christ Jesus? Only one or two. <laughs> all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. <clears throat> so, if you want to avoid persecution, go and live an ungodly life. Go and sin and sin some more. Uh, but then you might have the lake of fire waiting for you um, at, the, at the end. But that was not a threat by God, uh, but it was a promise. Um, and the thing is, we know that even when Paul was going through various persecutions and difficulties, uh, he had groups of Jews that had uh, made a covenant with death that they were not going to eat until Paul was dead. Well, Paul lived for about 15 years after that, so I don't know what happened to these other guys, um, but they were not um, uh, successful. But we see that persecution, and in, in, in Indonesia, we saw in uh, the uh, 1990s, 
when we had a big increase in persecution um, in Indonesia. And in the city of Jakarta, uh, we had um, uh, probably about 50 churches that were burned down. Uh, there were about 100 Christians that were slain and their bodies were chucked into uh, you know, a shopping, shopping mall carts and wheeled around the streets as they cried out, Allahu Akbar. And uh, uh, it was quite a terrifying time. Now, it had been a time of economic crisis. And our church at that time, which there was about uh, five and a half thousand um, in the church, uh, we had committed ourselves to look after our community, helping with food, helping with clothing, uh, people that were, uh, that were suffering. And then when the Jihad army came and they came into our area and they were burning down churches and they came to come down our street to where our complex was, the local Muslims put up barricades and protected us. And they said to the Jihadis, you will not touch them. When we were hungry, they fed us. When we didn't have clothing, they provided clothing for us. You will not touch them. And so our, our place was, uh, was preserved. So we saw that there was divine preservation in the midst um, of an ongoing um, persecution. In other parts of the country, uh, we've had our staff beheaded, blown up in, 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 in buses, uh, shot in the pulpit uh, while, while, uh, while preaching. Um, uh, one girl who was in the church that uh, we were uh, with in Poso, she was chased down the street and she was running across the bridge of the Poso River and then jihadis came the other way and they were charging towards her with machete knives. Well, she jumped into the river because, uh, you know, she didn't want to get uh, chopped up by the, these machete-wielding uh, Islamists. Well, she wasn't a strong swimmer, but she got to the bank, but they'd already got around there and they were slashing at her with a uh, machete knife and, and she was uh, killed there on the banks um, of that river. Persecution is real. And we need to understand that this is something uh, Jesus said, look, the world's going to hate you and they're going to persecute you because they hated me. Okay, now let's just see what Jesus taught in Matthew 24, uh, 9 to 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. So here is uh, Jesus saying there's going to be great tribulation. There's going to be many that are going to be killed. People who probably had a false idea of the gospel are going to become lukewarm in their faith. They'll become cold in their faith. Uh, they will betray even their own family members and say, no, 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 I'm not a Christian, but he is, you know, and... and uh, you know, it's going to be a terrible time that's coming and we need to be ready for it. Also, continuing on in Matthew 24, 15 to 22, Jesus said to them, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him, him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Uh, so obviously it's going to be a sudden attack. It's going to come by surprise. So be aware the church should not be surprised. We should be aware that these things uh, are happening and are going to happen. Uh, let him uh, who was in the field not go back to his clothes, uh, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there shall be great tribulation such as has not been seen uh, since the beginning um, of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Now, notice that there's two periods of tribulation. There's that first period of tribulation. Many uh, people are going to be killed. They're going to be chased. They're going to be persecuted. Uh, <clears throat> but the gospel is still going to get preached, and this gospel of the kingdom is going to be uh, preached to the ends of the world because the end, the end will not come 
unless the gospel has been preached in all nations. Then there's going to be this great tribulation like never before. So you've had this one period of tribulation, which is mainly uh, many Christians all over the world facing persecution, uh, great tribulation. But this last one is going to be such a fierce but a short period of time. Um, and this is the one where the church, the overcoming church, will be protected. They have finished the task. They're taken out on the eagle's wings power. They'll abide under the shadow of the wings um, of the Almighty. But those Christians who are a bit half-hearted, not full on for Jesus, those who were, um, well, it talks about the 30, 60, 100 fold. Well, um, we should aim to be the 100 fold. Uh, we want to give everything uh, to Christ. He's given everything for us. Now, notice what it, what it now says, continuing on in Matthew 24. So you've got this great tribulation. This is the time of the Antichrist. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So this is talking about that fierce time that, shall, that never was and never shall be again. And... <clears throat> After, immediately after. So you've got this reign of the Antichrist and what we call Great Trib Tribulation. Immediately after this Great Tribulation, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. Now notice this next phrase. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven and great glory. So this is not a rapture. This, this here, what we're seeing, is the coming of the Son of Man where every eye shall see him. But notice it says here, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels... This is Jesus. will send his angels with great sound of a trumpet, the last trump, and they will gather together all his elect, all the believers from all over the world, from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So he's going to get them all. And now this is the rapture at the end, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Um, now compare that with Revelation 24, 1 to 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Exactly what Jesus had said in, in Matthew chapter uh, 24. Revelation 1. Oh, it's chapter 1, verse 7. I don't know whether... So you can... These things happen. These, these computers, they, they haven't been spell-checked. <laughs> So it's Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. So Jesus taught uh, a post-tribulation rapture after the tribulation of those days. That's when he would appear, every eye would see him, all the tribes were going to mourn, and he would gather all his believers together and take them to be with him. The Apostle Paul also taught a post-tribulation rapture. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Now notice this, not everybody's going to die. There are those who are going to be alive and remain. Now this is, this is the overcoming church that's taken out and protected. They're going to be alive and remain. It is my prayer that everyone here will be amongst those who are alive and remain. Because those who are not among the alive and remain are going to get beheaded um, by the Antichrist. And nobody wants to volunteer for that. But the alternative is worse. Um, because the alternative, if you receive the mark of the beast, is that you will spend eternity in the lake of fire. So, but give Jesus your head now um, and uh, make him the head of your life, the head of the church. This we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Now, we're going to look at this word coming a bit more shortly. It's the Greek word parousia. And there's a number of events that the New Testament tells us are going to happen at the parousia. 
Uh, the second coming of Christ is going to happen at the, at the Parousia. Oh, oh, we're going to do that later. Okay. Alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Those who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who die in Christ. Okay? So we who are alive and remain, we can go before these ones, we cannot precede those who have died in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ, that's all of these ones who are asleep, the dead in Christ will, up. what will they do? They will rise first. So we who are alive and remain cannot precede those who have died in faith. Those who have died in faith must be raised from the dead first. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then, after that, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So you've got all of those who, had, who died in Christ raised from the dead. That's the first resurrection, the resurrection for the godly. We who are alive and remain until the end, together with them, we're going to get caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, there's something that happens in the twinkling of an eye so that we can actually get up there and meet the Lord um, in the air. And that's, Paul explains it in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, we won't all die, yeah? but we shall all be changed. So those who are raised from the dead, all the believers, going all the way back to Adam, right up until Jesus comes back again. So at the end of the Great Tribulation, all of those who were killed and slain by the Antichrist, beheaded uh, for their faith, they are included. If you want to say, well, how do you know they're included? There's a verse that says they're included. I'll show you. Uh, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, putting on glorious resurrection bodies. Uh, and that's why we'll be able to get caught up to meet the Lord in the air because we will have perfect, glorious, sinless bodies. The world doesn't have that. And that's why the world, they're going to get devoured by the brightness of his coming. The glory and the fire. Our God is a consuming fire, uh, it tells us in uh, the book of Hebrews. Uh, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So we experience this, wow, in the twinkling of an eye. Just blink your eyes for a moment. Hmm? That's the twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen so fast. All of our weaknesses, missing teeth, fallen out hair, eyes that a little bit, you know, all of it's going to get perfectly, gloriously healed and we will be clothed in, in, in the matchless glory of God and that will enable us to go into uh, his presence. Well, the Apostle John, he also taught a post-tribulation rapture in the book of Revelation. Now, uh, well, we couldn't write down all of these verses. we just not enough time to be able to read them all here, but you can read them at home. Revelation 1.10, we have the blowing of trumpets. Now, the book of Revelation is the Feast of Tabernacles. Mm -hmm. The Feast of Passover, that was when Jesus was crucified. That we read about that in, in the Gospels and also in a little bit in uh, 1 Corinthians 5. The Feast of Pentecost, uh, the second of the major uh, feasts, uh, that we see that in the book of Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the, the Holy Spirit. The third great feast in, in Israel was the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month. Now, number seven, the perfection. It's the, it's the culmination, the fulfilment. The book of Revelation outlines for us the events that happen in the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles began on the first day of the month with the blowing of trumpets. And that's why Revelation 1.10, the book of Revelation uh, begins with the blowing of trumpets. Then 
we have a 10-day period of tribulation, great persecution. This is that time when, when Christians are being slain and slaughtered um, all over the world. In Revelation 2.10, I love the way that the Lord puts this. He says, and you will suffer persecution uh, 10 days. Uh, be faithful unto death and you'll get the crown of life. He doesn't say you're going to escape death. He said, be faithful unto death, but you'll get a crown of life. Uh, so this 10 days of great persecution against the church, because Satan does not want the church to go on to perfection, doesn't want the church to become victorious, doesn't want the church to fulfill the divine mandate to be transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. He wants us to be weak and scared and, and, and run away. But God wants us to be triumphant and glorious, filled with his, his power and anointing and bringing about the greatest revival in history, which is going to happen um, in the last days. So those 10 days, and why 10 days? The number 10 in the Bible is a number of trial and, uh, and, and testing. Daniel, 10 days, you know, it was uh, the Ten Commandments. <laughs> That's quite a test um, for us. But on the 10th day was the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, the Yom Kippur, is the day that God declares his people perfect from all of their sins. In, in Revelation 8, uh, 1 to 5, we see that in the book of Revelation. Uh, in uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 16, uh, Hebrews chapter 9, um, uh, John chapter 7, it chapters that talk about this. Following the day um, of atonement were the four great days of harvest. They had four great days. This was the final harvest. So in Revelation 10, uh, we see uh, a bit of this final um, harvest. So from chapter 8 down through uh, chapter 10, and we'll see that the mystery of God is finished. Um, and part of the mystery of God being finished is the com uh, culmination um, of the Great Commission where this gospel is preached in all the world to all nations and seen multitudes. That's where Isaiah chapter 60 will be fulfilled. When God's glory manifested upon um, his church and it, and it says his glory will be seen upon you and nations are going to come running um, to this glory we are going to see a great outpouring of the spirit of God like never before and, and that's why we're being called to have faith but where does faith come from it comes from hearing the word of God so we need to study these things because as we read and study in the word of God, it imparts faith to us. Yes. And, and what we today see as impossible, we will see is not impossible to God and not impossible to those who believe. Well, who else taught a post-tribulation rapture? Well, the prophet Daniel did. He preached a post-tribulation rapture as well. Um, and we see this starting in Daniel chapter 7, uh, verses 21 to 24. I was watching and the same horn, now this is the Antichrist, this little horn, was making war against the saints. I wonder how long he's going to make war against the saints. And prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came. <laughs> so he's got a limit as to how long he's going to be able to persecute and kill uh, and take that sort of control it's until the Ancient of Days uh, comes. And a judgment was made in favour of the saints of the Most High. And the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So when the period of the horn, this little horns uh, ruling and reigning and persecuting uh, the saints, saints of God, at the end of that time, when his time is over, and he reigns for three and a half years, at the end of that time, it's now handed over to the saints. Um, of the, uh, the living God. And we might even say the living saints of the living God. <clears throat> Thus uh, he saith, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from uh, this kingdom. Now, verses continuing on, 24 to 27. And another shall arise after them, he shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. 
Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Now, how long is time, times, and half a time? Three and a half years. So the Antichrist is uh, given this period of three and a half years. That the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Now, this, of course, continues on into Daniel chapter 9. I'll skip that one for now and go straight to Daniel chapter 12. See, at that time, so now we've got to... Uh, uh, there's, uh, in the prophecy of Daniel 9, there's three and a half years left. And Daniel is trying to work out what's happening with this last three and a half years. Uh, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Oh, that's exactly what Jesus quoted uh, when he was talking about the Great Tribulation. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. There's going to be a deliverance for the people of God in that time of Great Tribulation. It's not being caught up. Now, I guess one of the reasons the teaching of a rapture arose is because pastors were trying to help their people escape uh, this suffering and the fear of uh, the Antichrist. But the thing is, we're going to overcome him. You know, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And, uh, okay, so at that time, your people shall be delivered. We're going to be taken on eagle's wings power. That's that second exodus um, that we talked about. Uh, shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book... And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, because there's two resurrections. There's a resurrection for believers. There's a resurrection for the ungodly. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Verses 4 to 6. Daniel... He's confused by this. If you think you're a little bit confused, spend time in prayer, studying the word, go over it again and again. Because even the prophet Daniel, that great man of God, he had trouble understanding. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and I saw two others. Now, here's the two witnesses of Christ. One on this river bank and the other on the other river bank. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, that's Christ, how long shall the fulfilment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever, it shall be for a time, times and half a time. So how much time left? Three and a half years. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. Although I heard, Daniel said, I did not understand. So you might be just like Daniel, that's okay. Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel. For the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. How wonderful. Well, let's just look at a bit of the chronology of what we have just been um, looking at. And this is taken from Daniel 9, verse 27, uh, where it says, He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the midst of the week he will cause the sacrifice and oblations to cease. That's talking about the crucifixion of Christ. And when it says there uh, that he will confirm a covenant with many for one week, you can only confirm something that already exists. Somebody says something, and says, oh yeah, I confirm that. It already has to exist to confirm it. And the covenant is the divine covenant. 
God had been making uh, this eternal covenant going back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden um, and then with Noah and then with Abraham and then with, with Moses and then with David uh, and then coming down into, uh, uh, into, the, into the New Testament, the New Covenant. And so when Christ came, uh, you, can, you can check your own Bibles here, but in Romans 15 verse 8, it says Christ came to confirm the covenant or the promises made to the fathers. So that was the ministry of Christ, to confirm um, the covenant. So when Jesus came in the middle of the week, in other words, after three and a half years, he put an end to sacrifice and oblations. He put an end to the system of the law. The one sacrifice of Christ completed all sacrifices forever. There is no more sacrifice for sin because the sacrifice of Christ is the one perfect sacrifice. Yep. So Jesus was 33 and a half years old when he was crucified. He confirmed the covenant and ended the sacrificial system of the law. And that happened uh, in the year 30 AD. And he had ministered, Jesus ministered for three and a half years. And then he died. Well, I guess this is why there was some confusion. Well, what about the last three and a half years? Well, we've seen in a number of scriptures, it's been put off till the time of the end. So there's a delay. And this delay is also called in the Bible the times of the Gentiles. Because the Jews had rejected the Messiah, the grace of God now came, even though it was Jews who took it, uh, because the apostolic company were, were Jews, but the, the gospel now went out to the nations. And Peter, he was uh, an apostle to the circumcision, but Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Um, and so the gospel was going out through, throughout all the world. And so the last three and a half years um, is when the Antichrist comes. Also the two witnesses, Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah, because a covenant to be confirmed has to be confirmed in the mouth of two or three witnesses. So you've got Jesus who proclaimed it, then you've got Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, and if you look in the book of Malachi, the last verses of the Old Testament tell us that there are two who are going to declare a testimony uh, to the Jewish nation, uh, and that is Moses and Elijah. It's mentioned in the last uh, verses um, of uh, the Old Testament. And so Moses and Elijah are going to come for three and a half years. Um, and they are going to pour judgment upon the Antichrist. In that great tribulation period of time, uh, Satan uh, and uh, his hordes, uh, the Antichrist, the false prophet, they're, they're going to be facing the greatest torment. You read from, let's say, from... Uh, uh, the book of Revelation, chapters 15 through to, to 19, they go through hell on earth. Um, and at the end of the three and a half years, they kill Moses and Elijah and they start sending Christmas parents to, uh, presents to everybody and saying, we got rid of them. But after three and a half days, they were raised from the dead. A bit of a shock for them. And then Jesus comes, the Battle of Armageddon um, happens um, and... Uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet are picked up and they're chucked into uh, um, the lake of, uh, lake of fire. Look at that time. I've only got 10 minutes left. I'm up to slide 18 out of 57. Um, uh, so uh, you, we won't get it all onto the video, but I encourage every one of you, if you can, uh, get a hold of uh, the PowerPoints. Even though you've seen the videos, on the PowerPoint, you can go through at your own rate, you can go through it slowly, you can read through the verses, you can check uh, the referen different uh, references. Um, but let's press on. The parousia, the, uh, when Jesus returns. Parousia is, is, is a Greek word that's used uh, constantly in the New Testament to describe the second coming of Christ. Uh, there's a number of words for coming, and we'll look at that in a minute. So the prophecy of Daniel, going back to 457 BC, was the proclamation uh, of, uh, the, for the nation of Israel to come out of the Babylonian captivity, come back to uh, Jerusalem and to rebuild uh, the city and the temple. And we find that 
when after this decree is given, the time is divided up into uh, seven weeks or seven periods of sevens, 62 weeks. Why? Why is this seven and 62 there? Well, the seven, seven sevens, that's 49 years. That's the time um, of the writings of the minor prophets from the time that uh, Haggai, um, Zechariah, and they all came back to, uh, to Israel at the time of the return from the Babylonian captivity. That 49 years was the final time for the writing of the Old Testament, particularly the, um, the minor uh, prophets. The 62 weeks is often what's referred to um, as the silent years. Um, it's often referred to 400 silent years from the end of uh, the Old Testament down to the time um, of John um, the Baptist. And then the three and a half years being the ministry um, of Christ until his crucifixion. Uh, now, we've already read those verses down there. I won't read those again. But you have the delay. Uh, the last half week is delayed. In Daniel 12, we're told it's put off till the time um, of the end. And that's when the final three and a half years. There is not a seven-year period at the end. There's nowhere in the Bible where it talks about a, a seven-year period at the end. It's only three and a half years. Um, you know, I'd like to stretch it out, make it a little bit longer, but that's what the Bible says. And uh, you don't have to believe me, but you do have to believe the Bible. And at the end of that three and a half years, Christ will return, and then we will have the 1,000 years. So now looking at the rapture, you've got the Antichrist begins his rule for three and a half years. You've got the exodus of the overcoming church for that three and a half years. Everybody else goes into the Great Tribulation. And at the end of that three and a half years, now in that period of time, the overcoming church is under divine protection. We don't need to be afraid of that period of time. We're going to be there in the, uh, in the, in the presence of our enemies and they won't be able to touch us. Uh, I think it's going to be a wonderful time. Um, but at the end of that time is when the last trump sounds and Christ begins to return. Then the dead in Christ will be, will be raised from the dead. We who are still alive and remain till the coming of the end will be changed and transformed and get these glorious bodies. And we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, the word that is used there, that we will meet the Lord in the air, is not a word describing we're going to go and stay somewhere. It's like when you go out to uh, greet somebody at your front door uh, you don't just stand there with them, you, you invite them to come in. And you come in with them. And this is what happens when Christ returns. We get caught up to meet him in the air because it says Christ will come with 10,000 times 10,000 of his saints. All of the saints of all ages are going to be there with him and we will return uh, with him in flaming glory. No ungodly person will be able to survive that. So the rapture at the end of that great tribulation and then come, brings us into um, the millennial reign of Christ for 1,000 years. Now, events that happen at the parousia. Uh, um, the, the word parousia means coming, specifically referring to the second coming um, of Christ. There's three important Greek words for coming. There's erkamai, just means coming. Parousia coming, Advent, especially the second coming. Now, that's taken straight from uh, the um, uh, uh, Greek dictionaries. And then you've got the Apocalypsis. Um, the book of Revelation is actually the Greek word for revelation is Apocalypsis. So Apocalypsis means revelation, coming, manifestation, appearance, um, unveiling. And these are different words that are used um, in the New Testament. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 to 17... We've read this before, but let's look at it again. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him, God will bring with him, Christ will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming, the parousia of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven uh, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So he's going to come, as it says, he will bring with him all of his saints, but we have to get caught up to greet him, um, you know, uh, up there in the, in the sky, and he's coming, and every eye is going to see him. And you've got all these millions, maybe hundreds of millions of believers coming with him uh, in, a, in, a, in a glorious parade filled with the shining glory um, of God. Well, there's a number of questions we could discuss, but we can't tonight. Can the living believers proceed, get raptured before the first resurrection? No. When is the first resurrection? Yeah, at the end of the uh, Great Tribulation. Who are the ones alive and remaining? <laughs> Hopefully it's you and me, um, but that's up to us. Uh, what about those believers who are beheaded by the Antichrist for refusing the 666? When do they get raised from the dead and transformed with glorious bodies? At the same time that everybody else does, at the end of the Great Tribulation. Now notice in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see, when we get saved, this is one of the amazing things that's, that's, that's happening. We're not just getting saved to have our sins forgiven. Our salvation brings about a transformation that when we are putting on the incorruptible, it means it will be impossible for us to ever sin again. That's why we will be eternally secure. Absolutely impossible to sin again because we will have put on the nature and the perfection of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruption, this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Hmm. When is the last trumpet? That's when Christ returns. And that's at the end of the period of the, the Great Tribulation. So the Antichrist begins ruling. He rules for three and a half years. In that three and a half years, the overcoming church is under the divine protection um, of God and all of the others are not. They're exposed to what's going to happen. At the end of that Great Tribulation, the rapture, the first resurrection, second coming of Christ, what a, what a glorious time that is going to be. Now, you've got all of these wonderful events here, which I'm not going to look at, but they're all in here about uh, eight different things that are going to happen at the Parousia. But I just wanted to come down to just a little bit at the end, because when, the, when Christ comes, some people say, oh, there's going to be a lot of unbelievers who are going to get into the millennium. No, no unbelievers will get into the millennium. They will all be slain by the glory of God in the second coming. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.7 When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. In Hebrews it says our God is a consuming fire. In Isaiah 33.14-15 Who among us, you know, we could ask this question amongst us, who amongst us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who amongst us? shall dwell with everlasting burnings. Any volunteers? Hmm? He who walks righteously and uprightly, because our God is a consuming fire. His glory is so great. You see, if we are walking in his righteousness and we've got these incorruptible, immortal bodies, we will be able to live in the eternal fires of God's glory. So who, who can live there? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. Isaiah 30 verse 26. Look at the glory that's going to be. The moon will shine like the sun and the sunlight will be seven times brighter. 
whoa. Okay, if you get to 40 degrees by seven, that's what, 280 degrees. Um, like the light of seven full days when the Lord binds up the bruises of his people uh, and heals the wounds of the inflicted. Uh, uh, Antichrist will be annihilated. Revelation 19.20, Then the beast, the Antichrist, was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs and in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and those uh, who worshipped his image. These, <coughs> these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. So they're, they're, they're off, and all of the ungodly are slain. All of the ungodly will then be taken before the great white throne judgment and then they too will be cast into the lake of fire. It's No wonder it's called the great and terrible day of the Lord. It's great for those who believe and terrible for those who don't. Um, so, you know, we, we need to have an understanding of the power of God that's going to get revealed in these last days and why we as the people of God, as the church of the living God, need to have a compassion and a passion for winning the lost because we are the ones that Jesus put here to bring the gospel to them. Yeah. It's not going to be Albanese and the Australian government. It's not going to be the Victorian government. It's not going to be, you know, the, the, the Buddhists or the Mormons or the JWs. We are it. We are the ones who are called to bring the gospel to these people so that they don't go into these eternal fires. We want to see them saved. Yes. We want to see the love of Jesus Christ being revealed and, and his passion manifest. But it has to be manifest in us. It's not going to come from out, just out there in the streets. It comes from you and me. So let, let's pray that the material that we've looked at over these four studies, some of it will be new, some of it might be confusing, some of it you may need to regurgitate and go over it and look at it again, some of it you may need to sit down with somebody and say, uh, look, that was a, um, you know, a little bit, uh, bit uh, deep or whatever, can you help me understand? And... Uh, Look, there's, there's people here who are willing to do that, love to do that, because uh, as uh, the people of God, we want every other person in the people of God to make sure that they are overcomers and not going into uh, that time of, uh, of great torment. So thank you for being here for these four studies. Um, the, uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about this subject, as you can probably guess. Um, but it's also why in our ministry in Indonesia uh, we've been able to see um, because the Indonesian Christians have gone through these fires of persecution. And, uh, you know, and, and, and some of them um, have been said, you know, intercessors from overseas have said, would you like us to pray uh, for the persecution to stop? And they said, no. Uh, uh, persecution is the seedbed um, of the church. And we're seeing so many people coming to faith. Don't pray for the persecution to stop, but pray that we'll have the strength to climb the mountain. Yeah. Um, and that's what, what I believe is a good way for us to finish uh, this series um, in looking into the end times and, and seeing what the Lord wants for us and just saying, Lord, we want you to have your way. And Lord, we thank you for the number of new people that have been coming uh, to GVCF and Lord, we just pray that, uh, that we will be stirred up and on fire and that we'll be witnesses, faithful witnesses for Christ. And that, Lord, that in the face of uh, persecution that will come in the, uh, in the days to come, that we will stand up boldly and declare our faith in Jesus Christ. So thank you, Lord. And we ask your blessing upon the word that we've looked at. And Lord, we just pray that your Holy Spirit uh, would correct any uh, errors, any misunderstandings, so that, Lord, that we only walk in your truth. Yes, we pray in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Good Praise word. the Lord. Thank you, Jeff. It's been We've been greatly blessed by this. Um, and I feel an obligation as one that normally runs our um, Bible studies. 
with a different methodology, that it'd be an opportunity for us when we come back, because I dare say there may be one or two questions and things you would like to discuss as a group. Debbie and Tamara aren't allowed to say anything at the time. <laughs> Just kidding. We do love that. So our next, in two weeks, we come back and I'm going to be open. And I'm going to ask you if you can have those uh, ones you the other ones. Uh, the whole four are uh, with... Um, the ones you flicked over? They're all, they're all on the PowerPoint. All right. So we'll have that. So look forward to more of the ones the Lord and God will be doing that.